All right, thanks a lot. I did have cynics in my presentation. Um, I just found out that by going second day towards the end, my jokes have been told, my content has been covered, um, but bear with me, some things will repeat and some things uh, will be new uh, for you. And I've tried to take kind of an interesting slice and hopefully um, anticipating that we'd be having a lot of overlap so that, so that we wouldn't. So today I want to look at um, the same problem, but we want to look at public institutions and uh, ad um, addressing the problem of misinformation with these institutions, okay? This will also help lead up to a breakout session that my colleague, Jesse McCarthy, is going to lead this afternoon when we get to that. So hopefully it'll help us prepare for those who participate with us uh, there. All right, let's start with some of the, the basics. Let's frame and all get on the same page. So there is confusion around online information. We all agree on that. It does not discriminate by age, and it does not discriminate by country. These players have all contributed to the problem. We know what those problems are. The producers blurring the lines between uh, fact and opinion, um, bias, uh, sometimes sloppy uh, reporting, uh, the news aggregators, um, unseen algorithms out there, um, a business model that um, um, supports uh, sharing of emotional um, information um, and um, the amplification um, process. In addition, news consumers. Um, they're lazy. They're, well, not lazy. We have bad habits. We've created bad habits due to trying to deal with this fire hose amount of information that comes at us um, every day. And, and I think we should be allowed to sort information by preferences, as long as we know what we're doing um, in, in that process, because there's no way we can keep up with everything. So these bad habits need to be changed. They need to be fixed. Agreed? So it's going to take all three of these players um, to help solve the problem. All right. So the problem with our, our news uh, producers and with our aggregators helping are that people don't necessarily trust top-down solutions. These stats um, prove that, but since stats can be changed and manipulated, we won't spend um, too much time on those. But we do know there's not a lot of trust for Facebook and Google to make right decisions for us, yes. And we know there's a lot of trust lost for our free press, for our media, um, and the job that they're doing. And we have multiple studies um, that prove that and that show that. But then there's also a little bit distrust for our government's um, government intervention as well. And that last stat, if you could have read it, if you were looking at this one up here, you probably read it. It showed that most people do not want the Internet regulated. Even though most folks do not want the Internet regulated, we are starting to see governments trying to respond and fix this issue of disinformation. Um, we talked yesterday about Germany and Germany um, fining social media platforms. I think it's important to point out that the, the fine is millions of dollars. And if it's not removed within 24 hours, that is most definitely going to infringe on free speech. On um, uh, Wouldn't you err on the side of caution if you were that one who was pulling it off to save your company um, millions of dollars? Um, in addition, we have um, uh, uh, bills uh, proposed in um, France that would give judges, um, emerge, grant judges emergency action to remove um, fake news, especially um, defamatory fake news around sensitive um, election times. What we didn't discuss yesterday was uh, in Malaysia um, that they just passed, and this was April, they passed um, a law about publishing and sharing fake news, and that comes with a hefty a six-year and $128,000 um, potential um, fine there um, for sharing um, uh, fake information. The first person uh, arrested or charged with this was someone who shared a YouTube video uh, claiming that it took police too long to respond to a shooting. Um, police say it was eight minutes versus 50 minutes. So there again, um, a gray area. And finally, the Kenyan uh, president signed a bill criminalizing 17 different types of cyber crimes. Um, oh, I did want to give you an update um, on the Malaysia, and I'll go back to that in a second. Um, criminalizing 17 types of cyber crimes and fake news. So people who knowingly share um, fake news can be fined up to $50,000 or jailed for two years. The Committee to Protect Journalists claimed that that would criminalize um, free speech. And right now, the courts have temporarily suspended 
Um, these provisions seem to endanger free speech, and the case was set to be heard on July 18th, and we're just waiting for um, a ruling. But back to Malaysia on the update there. Um, the country's new communications and multimedia minister said that the law would be repealed. All right. I want to make one more example. Most of you are probably familiar with this. India's 4G revolution has uh, brought on over 200 million users online. Um, and then this popular platform um, started, a uh, message sharing platform, um, started spreading fake news and it resulted in mob killings. Um, the Indian government called for uh, the, the uh, platform to fix this. So the app now labels messages as forward. It, forward instead of uh, composed by sender, limits forwarding the five recipients inside India and 20 and the rest of the world. And um, only group admins can send messages, and content is marked um, can be marked as uh, uh, suspicious. Despite this, the last mob killing was just two weeks ago. Which brings me to my point that we can't leave out consumer education when trying to combat this problem. The two building blocks are personal responsibility. We talked about that yesterday. Folks need to understand their role in a healthy information cycle, and we need to support community education. So what about museums? That's what we're going to talk about today. There are 50,000 museums in 202 countries around the world. Uh, and that's according to the International Committee of um, Museums. And there's no way to know that number for sure for anyone who's questioning that, but that gives you a sense of, uh, of an idea. Um, and visitorship in museums are, are growing. People trust museums. They are typically seen as non-political, and they're seen as educational. Most people trust museums more than they, uh, like for example, history museum, trust a museum more than they trust their teacher, or they trust a textbook, or they trust um, a relative. People, and when it comes to their mission, people also believe that museums should make recommendations on actions based on their topic. All right, so we need to go grassroots. There is a proof, there is proof that this works in Uganda, a study of 10,000 students through 120 schools. Half of those students, um, the students that were trained were twice as likely to be able to identify um, BS claims on um, health issues. So we know it works and we know some adults are showing that they would like to receive some of this, um, some of this training themselves. At the museum, we are working to um, help combat this problem through infographics that and we supply on our website on museumed.org, like the ones you see here. These are just a small sampling of the things we offer. So we are supporting teachers. Um, we are offering public programs on the issue. Um, we are going into libraries. We are doing programs with the State Department. We are doing discussions and lectures and workshops um, all around the country um, on this topic. Um, so we're having a, a big um, a big impact. I do want to point out, though, as important it is, I see that you see these are checklists. These are processes. Teachers like those. You have to do that. But along with the how, the museum teaches the why, the importance behind it, the responsibility, how our democracy depends on informed, um, effective consumers. So we get into those gray areas. And then we have people, then the consumers and the students and the, the, the um, adults, whoever we're talking to, they get buy-in on this issue, and then they all realize that they do contribute to the environment. So the question is investing in, um, in public serving institutions and alternative to policy. That is going to be our session, um, our breakout session this afternoon, and so we hope that you come and join our session so we can look at how maybe news producers, um, educational institutions, and, and tech, and, and others can work together to help solve this problem. Thank you very much.